get D Ray's thoughts. We had some games last night, and uh, let's start with that. You know, what did you think of the actual gameplay and the presentation that we saw in the Orlando bubble last night? Uh, to start with the presentation, I think it was great. I think they did a much better job than people expected. You know, you kind of heard whispers of kind of the same look that the TBT had had with the banners in the back, and everybody was really interested to see what happened with the fans, but I think it was great. As far as the games, I mean, some guys, they got some rust to shake off. But you didn't like I the Brooklyn think, Nets? Know. Yeah. <laughs> they were a tough yeah, watch. Harder. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, man. Some people, it's, it's going to take a minute to get their legs back. But, hey, man, the NBA is back, so – you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, look, it was what it was last night. You're going to get a couple of these games before the season actually starts in uh, two yeah. weeks from now. But, uh, you know, one of the things, it seems that the Sixers will play tomorrow and we'll get our first chance. But uh, I think they have been one of the more intriguing things. But it's almost like, you know, how do you read this team? It's like put up or shut up time for this team. It's like what do they have, you know, um, what do they have another gear in them that we saw from the regular season? I guess is what everybody wants to know. I'm hoping so. I'm hoping so. I, I don't see how this team stays together without that. I think it's no secret that at this point everybody's kind of under a microscope between Ben Simmons and his postseason play, Joe and B just following through on his word and being consistent with it. And obviously, there's a slew of people that want Brett Brown's head on a stake. So it's like between those three guys kind of being under such a microscope, it it kind of envelopes the entire team. So I'm hoping they have another gear. I honestly think that that change with Ben Simmons going to the four, like I said before, is like the best thing they've done in a while and Shake Milton kind of being that half point, sorry, half court point guard. But I, I think we're going to be pleasantly surprised, shall I say, um, when they step out there tomorrow. It's going to be a little rusty at first. I don't see it. You know, they go out there and look like the Miami Heat in 2012, but I think they're going to be clicking at a different level. because They got something to prove. Brett mentioned Joel Embiid was not on the floor with Al Horford at all during these practices. So if he does play that 35 to 38 minute range, that only gives Al somewhere between 10 and 13 minutes. Is that enough? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I honestly think it is. I mean, obviously, I don't think they're going to punch a clock at 38 and be like, all right, we have to take him out. I think it's going to vary. But, you know, Al Horford being in that 10 to 20 minute range to me is not the worst thing. Like I've said before, I, I love Al Horford. I love his uh, his kind of presence in the locker room. You know, you heard talks this week of Kyle Quinn being kind of that Udonis Haslam type character where he's not the biggest rotation guy, but he's a huge presence in the locker room, a huge presence with the younger guys. I thought Al Horford would be that, but I feel like between that role and really just going out there and his 10, 15 minutes just being a microwave for defense and offense like he can be, it's, it, I feel like with certain guys, you draw back their minutes, you up their production. And Al Horford's not, you know, he's not exactly the youngest guy out there anymore, so I feel like he's at that stage in his career. Now, he's kind of downplayed his concerns about his role going forward, uh, but, you know, he was he said that he hadn't talked to Brett Brown on whether he and Embiid would share the court together, but um, is the best move for the Sixers to kind of uh, limit Horford's minutes? Do you think that makes sense? I mean, here's a guy that they paid big money to kind of be the difference-making player. Now, all of a sudden, it seems that the plan is to kind of get away from using him. I mean, I, I got to be realistic. I, I've said it before, you know, on other shows, I got to be real. Like, I think they overpaid him. I think they're starting to realize that. They really realize through this season, but, like, they, they overpaid him to me. The whole point of getting him was to get him off the Celtics and to get somebody to kind of mentor this younger team, but specifically Joel Embiid. And then they gave him that much money. I'm not an upstairs guy. I don't know how they made that decision, but I feel like they overpaid him for what they really wanted him for. I don't ever think that he really fit in this scheme. Like, you have a team where, let's call it what it is, you know, Ben Simmons moved to the four, quote-unquote, now, but he's still the true point guard. Like, your best player plays in transition. You know what I mean? Your big man plays inside and out equally, like, it's just not – it just doesn't seem like a good scheme of basketball for Al Horford through and through. But like I said, for stretches of the game, for him to just go in there and be a microwave on both sides of the floor, I feel like that's going to – that's when you get the most use out of him, and that's when you really get his value uh, completely used. You mentioned Ben Simmons, and we've been asking a lot of our guests. Gil and I have a bet over under four and a half, three-pointers for Ben Simmons just to take in the eight-game regular season. Do you go over? Do you go under? Uh, I'm going over. I'm sorry. I, I don't see how he doesn't at least take one a game. I'm, I'm going over. I, I got him 
clocking out at about seven or eight three. Wow. By the, yeah. Now, what yeah. has you convinced that he is finally able to kind of shake this? I mean, I'm not convinced yet, but I'm saying that he's going to do all these practices we're seeing and everything. And like, me and Rose have talked about it in the sense of, all right, is the media kind of pushing him to do this? Is the team media pushing him to do this? It really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, the footage is out there. He knows about it. He's answered questions on it, saying he's going to shoot in Orlando. And I feel like, if anything, these is, this is the time to kind of get the, ah, I guess you say jitters out. So you know, he's going to throw up a couple shots. And I'm really hoping he shoots him with a clear mind. But to do that, you got to take a few, which is why I'm going with over five. Well, if, sure. if, if the first game goes by and you don't see any, would you start getting nervous? A little, a little. I, I ain't gonna lie to y'all. A, a little bit. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I well, feel as if game one. But what about tomorrow's we're game? We're gonna know. Well, do these I, scrimmage I like games matter? Do these scrimmage games matter in your thought on that? Yes, yes. Because the more he shoots and the more comfortable he's still shooting it, the better it's gonna be when it actually counts. You know what I mean? You can't practice, 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 and then you know don't do it in a game, and then expect to do it in a big moment. So I feel like to be ready for that big moment, he's gonna. And not saying they're gonna give him the ball when it's time to get a three at the end of the game. But to be ready for the bigger moment, shall I say, you got to kind of just take them when it, it seems to mean nothing, like a scrimmage game. Yeah, I, I would be very disappointed if in one of if these scrimmage games, you're looking at it and it's the same style where he's bringing the ball up, getting to the foul line, turning his back, looking around. and that. But I would be pretty – I'll see what you think, D-Ray. Would you be pretty surprised if that's what we saw from him – even if he doesn't shoot a three, that if they use him in the offense the same way? I would be shocked. At that point, I would I would lose a lot. No, no, this, this is why. After all these promises between Joe and B saying how good they got uh, Tobias Harris and different guys, you know, I'm pretty sure Josh Richardson was another guy who said they were going to go out there and, you know, things have been chippy in practice combined with Ben Simmons saying he's going to shoot them and the clips from practice. If the combination of all that, equals it looking exactly the same, I'm shocked. And as a fan, I'm pissed. You know what I mean? Like, that's not what I want to see at all. But like I said, between Brett saying what he did, Joel saying what he did, Ben kind of doubling down on that, and the team's atmosphere and just energy they've had around them, I can't see it looking the same, almost at all. Let's switch gears a little bit to the leadership side of things. I'm amazed by how much Tobias Harris has stepped up when it comes to all of these issues going around in the world. And it seems like he found the way that he can be vocal the best in between a Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid, who are the quote-unquote superstars of this team. So talk about Tobias Harris's ability to step up and be a different type of leader on this team and how important that is. Uh, I hate to keep comparing it, but it's it's the freshest one in my mind as far as like the team that did it. But when I think of the Warriors, if I had to peg Tobias Harris as anybody, it would kind of be a a pseudo Sean Livingston, you know, Andre Iguodala type of six where you have a guy who he's not necessarily known as the most vocal leader, but it's no, you know, uh, misinterpreting that his teammates look up to him for several reasons. A guy who's seen enough basketball a little bit more than Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons, quite frankly. And he just seems like a well-rounded individual and that kind of translates to who he is on the court. So I feel like his leadership is going to be a huge part of it. Probably at the end of it, it'll be one of the things that's, a little unheralded and it won't be as talked about as, you know, John Bede having a big breakthrough or Brett Brown making a coaching change that finally gets people off his back or things like that, or Ben Simmons shooting a three in crunch time. You know what I mean? Like those will be some of the bigger stories, but I feel like his leadership is one of the things that is really going to take this team over the top now, when it comes down to it. Now, D-Ray, do you think that the Sixers and Brett Brown to some extent have put some pressure on uh, ben Simmons, you know, by putting videos of him shooting and then basically Brown said what last uh, Friday or so that, hey, he shot more threes in Orlando than he had in practice the whole year. Mm-hmm. I absolutely think they put a little pressure on him. I don't know if it was any malice behind that pressure. This thing is good pressure, but, you know, pressure is pressure. And them, like you said, putting out those videos, Brett Brown saying those comments to the media just outright. Uh, you know, and candidly, I, I feel like they definitely put a little pressure on him. But like I said before, this team is at a point where I feel like that pressure is good for them. All of them kind of need pressure. You know what I mean? You you work a little different when you got something on your back like that. So I'm, I'm hoping that pressure makes him show up. 
Yeah, the way I see it now is I'm going to give him one mess up. And what I mean by that is if he gets to a spot on the floor and you think to yourself after, damn, he should have shot that one, that's his one mess up because then he realizes, okay, okay, the next time I get to that spot, I'm going to shoot it. If it happens twice, then I'm completely out. So I will give him the one mess up for him to realize that's the spot I should have shot it. I, I think that's I think that's more than fair. I can't even disagree with you at this point. Like we said, we all as fans at this point we want to see it. So I'm, I'm with you on that. The well, one mess up is good with me. So here's the question: the videos that we saw, essentially, you know, Simmons catches and shoots like in rhythm. Do you think that he pulls up three, or are they going to call plays specifically for him to do it? Uh, I think it's going to be one of those things, like, if you feel comfortable, do it. I don't think they're going to draw up a play just yet. Maybe one, you know, at some point in the game when they're up a lot or maybe to kind of start things off, I don't know. But I can't see them drawing up a play where he comes off a pin-down screen and, you know, shoots the gap out to the corner and then somebody throws it over top of two defenders and he shoots from the three. Like, I, I can't see him being out there like Ray Allen. I, I kind of see huh. it looking like it did in practice where – he catches, all right, y'all not out here, cool, I'm going to take it. Or if he rhythms in the one, cool. But I don't see him going out there being like, this is our guy. Should be interesting tomorrow. They're back, 3.30, Sixers basketball against Memphis. You can hear the game right here on 97.3 ESPN. We talk NBA with D-Ray, Daryl Reynolds uh, from the 2016 Villanova Wildcats. He's one of the hosts of the Processed Podcast, where they'll be talking more Sixers as the Sixers restart is about to happen. And he, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. All right, D-Ray, we'll catch up soon, pal. All right, fellas, talk to you all next week.